Buldukuvara, an early medieval Hungarian castle perched atop a mountain and overlooking the beautiful hills and plains of Borsodabui Zemplin County. With the first tower having been completed in 1280 as a result of the Mongol incursions into the region and the rest of the fortress following suit in the 14th century, I knew I simply had to see it. This is your favorite weary traveler, Mr. Minarchist. So, dear viewer, grab yourself a drink, get cozy, and let me tell you all about Bulldog Kuvara. <laughs> You simply can't discuss Hungarian history without first mentioning the House of Arpad. In fact, they still hold relevance in Hungarian history long after the house went extinct, and the family's coat of arms still holds a place in the country's crest. The Arpad dynasty would technically begin with King Stephen I, or Sint István Király, the first Christian king of Hungary in the year 1000, yet it would be his distant relation, King Béla IV, who would order the construction of several fortresses, Buldag Kuvara included. It would be after the Mongols slaughtered over half of Hungary's total population at the time that King Béla would begin taking these preparations for the next time the hordes would invade. I didn't do nothing to you. You just mean because you're- Mongolian. Yeah, it's because you're- Mongolia. Well, you're mean. I did nothing to any of you. But you know what? Everything's underway. I don't have much longer. So, does that make you happy? After the Mongol incursions were eventually repelled, the Arpad dynasty would, like so many other European royal families of the time, rise and fall. And after the death of King Andras, or Andrew III of Hungary in 1301, so too did the dynasty paving the way to a bloody interregnum in which Poles, Bohemians, and Germans claimed the throne of Hungary, all the while the castle of Buldag Kuvara was ignored, until everyone's favorite dynasty, the French House of Anjou, claimed the throne, bringing a peace to Hungary not seen since before the Mongol invasions. When King Karoy, or Charles I of Hungary, took power, he immediately began confiscating the lands of Hungarian nobles who hadn't supported him, Game of Thrones style. And he gifted Buldag Kuvara to the Drugeth family, a Frankish-Hungarian house. During the Renaissance, Buldag Kuvara, in the hands of the Drugeth family, would no longer serve as a fortress, but more like a palace and palaces need peasants. So, House Drugeth built a village, Buldag Kuvaraya, which still exists today directly under the hill on which the castle stands. Unfortunately, during this era, like the Arpads before them, the Hungarian Anjou dynasty would die out, and in their place would again be the Germans. Well, briefly, in the form of King Sigismund of Luxembourg and Hungary. However, through complex royal marriages and other such alliances, the keys to Hungary would eventually find their way into the hands of the Habsburgs, in the form of King Albert, or Albert, of Hungary. These events would place the Drugeth family of Bulldog Kuvara in a very tricky situation, as the guy who gave them their castle was obviously dead. And that begs the question, to whom do they pledge their loyalty to? Well, evidently, and in true Hungarian fashion, it wasn't going to be an Austrian, not Sigismund, and certainly not King Albert. Which put Albert into a bit of a predicament of his own. There's only one thing you have to do. Become King of Hungary. After changes in the castle's ownership were recorded, the already foggy records on Buldog Kuvara became even foggier at this point in the story. We do know that the castle was eventually seized by the handsome King Albert, 
But it is around this point in the early 1400s that the castle fell into the hands of rebels against the crown, that's all they're defined as. Whether or not these rebels were in fact the Drugath family, or those loyal to the Drugath family, is unfortunately far too obscured, and in fact debated amongst historians. The castle itself doesn't appear on any records until the rise of House Hunyadi, the same House Hunyadi headed by the great warrior and Hungarian folk hero Hunyadi Janos, and the very same House Hunyadi that was brought to its greatest and most powerful extent by the only Hunyadi king of Hungary, and the son of Janos, Matthias Király, or Matthias Corvinus. To cut a long story short, in order not to segue from the topic of Bulda Kuvara, and to save this particular story for perhaps another video down the road, it simply had to be mentioned. Good King Matias. Well, badass is a bit of an understatement. He had famously raised one of the first professional armies in history, dubbed the Black Army. In fact, this is how the castle reappears in historical records as he had used it as a fortress for the Black Army before giving it to the Parlaggi brothers, uh, believed to have been members of his court in the merchant class. Additionally, King Matthias had brought over the arts of the Renaissance to Hungary. He had conquered Vienna, and was said to be the only European ruler that the Ottoman Sultan was afraid of. He had even kept the real-life inspiration for Count Dracula, Vlad Tepes, on good terms. Even he paid his rent to King Matia some time. But to return to the topic at hand, under King Matthias Corvinus, the castle was again a fortress ready for battle, rather than any semblance of a royal residence that, say, Visegrad was. Unfortunately, being a mortal man, the king died, taking all of the gains he had made for Hungary with him, and leaving his beloved kingdom to those who resorted to infighting. And after King Matthias died, another enemy planning an incursion not unlike that of the Mongols was lurking in plain sight. <laughs> ah yes, the Ottoman invasion of Hungary, and the subsequent century-long Islamic occupation. However, Bulda Kuvara didn't really see action as the Ottoman incursions were stopped at the Battle of Eger. Bulda Kuvara instead found itself lying in wait to combat Hungary's next foe. After the Austrians had liberated Hungary from their Turkish occupiers, they had wasted little to no time at all in taking their place. This, however, angered a great many of the Hungarians, you got, you rude, those of which rallied behind the Prince of Transylvania at the time, Ferenc Rakotsi, or Francis II of Transylvania. The Kurutz rebellions of 1703 to 1711 against Habsburg rule would take place predominantly in eastern Hungary, and Bulda Kuvara was one of many rebel strongholds. Eventually, in 1705, the castle was bombarded in a siege against imperial Austrian regiments, which led to its eventual capture and destruction at the hands of the Austrians, leaving the castle abandoned until the late 1800s. <laughs> such a mistake, living such a close distance to living history, and never going to see it. So I headed out along with my favorite traveling companion, and well, also my translator, Bensa, to Buldo Kuvaria. Well, despite it being a rainy day, <clears throat> it's not many opportunities that you get to see actual history. Being in California, there are several European tourists that wanted to see things that we never thought twice about mainly redwood groves, but here, they sit next to physical history. Well, despite the heavy rain and the hike up the hill from the village, the scenery was breathtaking. 
Embarking on the 20-minute walk towards the castle gate, tourist signs had signaled our approach to the museum, and by the time my calves were burning from some much-needed exercise, we had made our way to the drawbridge, and from there, immediately into the ruins of the main courtyard. Unfortunately, I had took a wrong turn and ended up in the dungeon, complete with instruments of torture. But, ascending up the stone steps and heading towards the ramparts and the main tower, I was completely immersed in the experience of what these places must have looked like 700 years ago. Or looking out from the bastions at what were ancient battlefields, remembered only by the castle and not all too often pondered about by the villagers who have lived in the castle's shadow all their lives. The castle, Bulldog Kuvara, was built in the 14th century, and the view out here is simply breathtaking, rain or shine. After having my fill of the gorgeous view, and after having explored the castle's walls, I decided it was time to enter the pavilion, the oldest part of the castle. The central pavilion is made up of the living quarters, kitchens, and other such exhibits befitting of a museum of, of this stature. At the top of the pavilion, there was a war room. I mean, look at me. I felt like King Matias. But also there was a museum section, including many models and dioramas of what the castle had looked like and what it had seen through its long existence. The dioramas of the battlefield are set up in such a way that you can see where the actual battle took place just out the window. It also featured weaponry used by the castle's defenders from the Drugath family's occupation to the Karuts Rebellion. And speaking of weaponry, it was time for me to visit the armory at the bottom of the pavilion. <laughs> Everything from the authentic 13th century suits of armor, to the armaments, the crossbows, pole arms, long swords, and spy handers, for a history nerd like myself, it was a dream come true. Especially the 14th century chain and plate mail armors bearing the heraldic symbols and icons of the aforementioned House Drugath in particular. But nothing prepared me for the true prize in the room. It was a set of armor, bearing no symbols, and really nothing to identify it at all, but for the black metal it was made from, and its iconic Salat helmet. What you see before you is the armor of King Matthias's black army in all its glory. So, by the tour's end, you can imagine my delight in seeing such artifacts, but alas, all good things must come to an end. Yes, it was time for the team to head out. Unfortunately, we had missed our bus, and the storm had decided to start picking up, which brings us to the next leg of our journey. Although the route was indeed scenic, it was all around a bad time, as that rain was not letting up. In fact, it was a torrential downpour. Before. It's worse than before. <laughs> anyway, that concludes this little documentary, I suppose, and I really enjoyed making it. Tell me what you think in the comments, and I hope you enjoyed. Anyway, this has just been one weary traveler, Mr. Minarchist. Keep your heads on a swivel out there. It's a big, big world.